We'll say the whole three-line prayer three times. Are you ready? All right, here we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for the gift of these beautiful young disciples sitting in lawn chairs six feet apart. Lord, we ask you to come upon all of us this day and bring your power, bring your glory, bring your love, and help us feel your presence. And so we put away all of our worries and our wonders and our fears, and we just ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit in a powerful way. And so together we pray, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Lord, we give you this day. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. You know, there's a, a beautiful story about an old man who lost his bride of 72 years, and his health was in such a state that he couldn't care for himself anymore, so they had to take him to a nursing home. And at the age of 97, a young nurse wheeled him down the hall towards his new room. And he asked this nurse, he said, can you, can you tell me what I'll see in my room? Can you tell me what it's like? And she, in great detail, as they wheeled down the hall, she explained uh, the color of the paint on the walls, and she described the curtains and, and the rug and the chair and the comforter on his bed. And as she got almost to the room, she stopped short of his doorway and stopped in the hall, and the man exclaimed with all the joy and gladness you can imagine. He said, oh, it's so beautiful. And she said, we're not there yet. And you're blind. How do you know? And the old man smiled, and he said, oh, that's simple. He said, I decided already to love it. He said, I chose already to be happy and content here. He said, my faith in God allows me to believe that he will take care of me in every situation, and I just remember to make my mind up in a positive direction first. And as I think about this spring we've had and the summer we're facing and the fall right around the corner, there's so much uncertainty. But there are all these people trying to tell us what to feel and, and what to do and how to behave, and most of them are a little off balance. And so we're left wondering. And so we have to be a little like that old man, and we have to make our mind up first that life's going to be great because we belong to him. There's a there's a verse that Jordan read, and it was all over the bulletin and all over your Instagram feed and, and all over everywhere about the verse to today. And there's that line, Lord, where should we go? Now, Jordan told you a little bit of that story, but if you really read that story in John chapter 6, imagine being there, right? Jesus shows up to teach, and, and when he did that, crowds and crowds and crowds of people came because they wanted to see, and they wanted to hear, and they wanted to feel, and, and they wanted to be healed, and they wanted to be a part of it all. And so we know from Scripture that sometimes those crowds were in the thousands, Right? So these people show up this day waiting to hear something amazing and, and see something hopeful from this Jesus that they're so enthralled with. But that day, he gave a teaching that they just couldn't quite wrap their mind around. Right? You will, you will eat my body. You will drink my blood. And imagine being in a place like this with, with people everywhere. And as Jesus is teaching, I mean, they just start picking up their lawn chairs and going home. Now, I can imagine standing here and saying something you don't like and you just starting to pick up and leave, and it's like, oh, my gosh, that would be awful. But it didn't seem to bother Jesus at all. And as they got up to leave, instead of Jesus saying, okay, wait, 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 come back, come back, let me try this again, and saying it in a, a softer way, right, sugarcoating it a little, saying something like, no, 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 guys, come back, come back, what I meant was it's a symbol of my body and blood. Now that's not what Jesus did. Jesus amped it up. And he's like, unless you eat my flesh 
and drink my blood, you will not have eternal life. And many even more got up and left and said, ah, this is too hard. This is too hard. They were confused. They were frustrated. They didn't understand, and so they just walked away. And then the few people that were left at the end, Jesus didn't look at them and say, hey, guys, thanks for hanging out with me. Right? Way to support. Way to support. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're still here. No, that's not what he said at all. He looked at him and he said, why are you going to go too? Kind of like, why are you still here? Are you like the rest of them? And Simon Peter, those magic words, Lord, where would we go? Right? He knew that Jesus was it. He knew that was all he needed. And so today, in this world of uncertainty, we're here today to stand and profess that one truth. I know, Jesus, I know you're it. I know there's a lot of stuff I don't understand right now. There's a lot of stuff that's frustrating. There's a lot of stuff that's cramping my style and making me a little afraid, but it's okay. You're it. You're my it. Now, there are some truths that we need to wrap our mind around as we begin today. There are some truths we need to think about and let soak in so that the Holy Spirit can do mighty work in our hearts today. And one of those truths is we forget who we are. Now, I'm going to ask you to, to do something for me, and you're going to maintain your social distance, which means in order to be heard, you're probably going to have to yell. But I want you to pick the person near you. And when you look at this person in the eye, I want you to, to answer the following three things, right? I want you to say, my name is blank, I am a blank, and I blank, right? So if I were answering this, I would say, um, my name is Sherry, I am a mom, and I do laundry. Or my name is Sherry, I am a teacher, and I grade papers, right? So think about how will you answer that. My name is blank, I am a blank, and I blank. Are you ready? Okay, find that person you're going to screech at and take turns answering those three questions. Go. have better ears than me. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're good. All right, now, I want to know who sat by someone that said uh, something like, my name is Elizabeth, I am a daughter of the king, and I'm growing in holiness. Or, my name is, is Jake, I'm a son of the king, and I'm a saint in the making. Okay, raise your hand if you sat by someone who said something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know why? You know why you didn't say that? You didn't say that because we are so busy thinking about what we do that we forget whose we are. If I could remember, if you could remember, if we could remember that above all, I'm, I'm a child of God. Right? That's a truth that we often forget. And we have to wrap our brain around the fact that we have a function and we have a purpose and we were created for something, right? Now, I, I've got my, got my spoon here, right? Now, everybody's got these in their house, probably lots of them. And most of us use one every single day, right? We eat it, we use it to eat our ice cream, to soup, um, cereal, right? We use that spoon again and again and again and again. And I am so thankful every time I use it for the person who created the spoon. I don't know who it was. It was probably a caveman, and it was out of wood or stone or something. It, but it's evolved over time, and it's a useful tool. Use it every day. Very grateful for the creation of the spoon, right? Raise your hand if you've used a spoon today. <laughs> All right, so yeah, and I, we probably don't look at that and go, oh, I am so thankful for the spoon. No, we just use it, right? But if I were to ask you to take the same spoon and go use it to dig a hole and plant a six-foot maple tree, this spoon would not be quite so spectacular, would it? Because that's not what it was created for. See, each of us were designed for a specific purpose. We were all given specific gifts and talents and abilities to do something God forethought before we were even born. 
and we run around like that spoon trying to do something that's not really our job and we forget that we were created to be saints that's why god sent us to the serve so that we could live a life growing in holiness and return to him as a saint as a member of the communion of saints that's that's our mission so how do we do that how do i choose to be positive how do i know he's it how do i live like simon peter and say lord i'm going to come to you because i don't know where else to go how do we do that well our first clue our first lesson is in Psalm 139. And it very clearly says in that beautiful psalm, I'm going to read it so I get it right, you knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you in my mother's womb. God doesn't say I, I glue gunned you in your mother's womb. He doesn't say I duct taped you in your mother's womb. He doesn't say, I power stippled you into your mother's womb. No, he knit us. Now, I can't knit, I make knots. But my mother-in-law is incredible. And all of her 40-some grandchildren have Afghans that she knitted. They're beautiful, right? And I would watch her and the precision and the calculated thought and the time and the energy and the perfection it took to create that was really pretty amazing. And when I think about how hard it is to knit something beautiful, I have to go back and think, well, that's what God did to me. And the result is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're perfect. We're perfect to do exactly what he wants us to do. But we spend so much time looking at everybody else thinking, oh, I want to be like them. I wish I could do that, or I wish I'd look like that, or I wish I had that ability. And we don't realize that God's got a special purpose just for us. And we're made perfectly to do just that. Now, when was the last time you woke up, looked in a mirror, and said to yourself, oh, good morning, aren't you fearfully and wonderfully made? Yeah, probably, like, never, right? Well, I want you to look at that same person you talked to just a minute ago and yell to them the words, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Go. Now, I know it's been four months since we've been in school, and you might forget how it works, so I'm going to refresh the, the memory, all right? So here's how it works. The teacher teaches, and then the teacher assigns homework so that you can practice and learn the important information that the teacher taught you, right? That's how it went. Do you remember that? Okay, well, here's your homework. The next seven days, so every day between now and next Saturday, I need you to look in a mirror. It can be the rearview mirror of your car. It can be in the bathroom. It can be wherever, whenever you see a mirror in which you stop and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You can say it out loud if you're brave. You can say it in your head if you're feeling like that's pretty weird. Okay? But I want you to say it to yourself every day for seven days and realize that's God truth. He's it, and that's what he said to us. The second part of your homework is before you leave tonight, after you've had all of the greater burgers and french fries and elephant ears your bellies can hold, I want to make sure that before you leave, you have said you are fearfully and wonderfully made to at least five people who are here. Now, I don't want them to be the five people you know best or came with. I want them to be people maybe you haven't really talked to, maybe people who are younger, maybe people who are, you know, just new to you in a way. Maybe it's someone waiting in the elephant ear line behind you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when someone says that to you, this is what you reply. You look at him and you say, thank you. I forgot. Because we forget. We forget. Simon Peter, Lord, where would I go? We need to go to him. And he says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The second truth we need to wrap our minds around before we enter this day is from Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day, right? It's also that line from the Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. And what do we do? Oh, we get so stuck in what's in the past. It's so easy for us to look back on the last four months and say, golly, I didn't get to do this. I didn't get to do that. This was so weird. 
I got cheated out of that. And we can get stuck in all of the things we think we missed. Jesus isn't there. Jesus is here. He's in the present. He's in this day, this beautiful, gorgeous day with no rain when there was supposed to be rain, with 86 degrees instead of 97 and matching humidity, right? He is here, and he's giving us this beautiful day, right? He is not next fall, right? We might be sitting there thinking, gosh, are we going to go back to school in August? Are we, are we going to have to split? Are we going to are we going to be able to play a, a football? And, and, and are we going to are we going to be able to run cross country? Or are we going to have to play baseball? Or are we going to what are we going to do? Are we going to have to learn from home? Or do we get to go? Or are we going to have to skip every other seat on the bus? Or are we going to what do we you know if I'm in college? What do I get to do? Do I get to go live in college? Or I have to stay in Westphalia? I don't know. It's so easy to get stuck. And what's going to happen? And that's the future. And he's not there yet. He's here this day. And so he has given us this beautiful day, this perfect day, to just settle down and choose him, to focus on him, to focus on this day and the gifts he has. The other truth that we need to really wrap our minds around I could take this, right, and I could, I could plant flowers in it and put them on my new front porch. I could plant a plant in it and put it in my classroom. I could, I could do all kinds of. I could paint it. I could, you know, turn some six-year-olds loose with glitter. I could, oh, I could fancy it all up, and it would be so cool. But what you don't see is that. And if I was going to keep this. I would have to work really hard to keep that hidden from you, right? Because it's broken. In fact, I'm packing up our house to move, and I have this sitting on my desk, and I watch Dave walk through the house with it in his hand to take to the garbage. And it's like, wait, 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 don't throw that out. I need that. And he goes, what are you, nuts? He said, it's broken. I said, I know. So are we. All of this has left us a little broken, right? A little disappointed. And you know, all of us will face experiences where we have broken relationships and broken promises and disappointments, and we can feel like sin has led us to be unworthy of God's love, and God isn't surprised by it at all. In fact, he knew it would happen, and he loves us all the more in our brokenness. And when we realize that instead of trying to hide our brokenness, if I just take that to the Lord, he will come and he will restore and refine and renew and perfect. That's what he does. And the other thing we as a society would be much well served by is if we would realize that everybody else around us is broken too in ways we don't see in ways we don't understand, but in ways that need God's love and mercy. So we are a broken people. And today, when you pray, when you go to adoration, when you go to Mass, ask the Lord to enter into your brokenness, enter into your disappointment, enter into your grief and your sadness and your worry and your anxiety, and just say, Lord, make me whole, make me new. Help me choose. Help me choose you. Help me choose your love. There's one more truth that we really need to wrap our minds around today. And if I put up this gallon of milk, that Hercules put the lid on, if I put up this gallon of milk and I say, you know what, this is us. This is us at creation, right? It's beautiful, it's pure, it's white, it's undisturbed. Now, God knew that it would be hard to stay just that way. And so at our baptism, that first sacrament where we entered into Christ's love in a powerful way, he gave us a gift. And he gave us a gift that would help us in those moments of despair, those times of temptation, he gave us a gift that will help us choose him. He gave us a gift that will help us be like Simon Peter and say, Lord, 
Where should I go? You're it. Help me choose that. And that gift that he gave us to help us put that all in order, that gift was the Holy Spirit. And so at our baptism, we were given just a giant heap of the Holy Spirit. And you know, if I just let it go, I don't really see it, right? It just falls to the bottom and it just sits. But if I realize that, that the more I want God to be a part of my life, the more I realize he's it, the more I ask him to come in and change me, then I realize the more transformed things become and my actions change and my thoughts change and my life becomes sweeter. And then, then I get confirmed and I get, oh man, I get even more. I get even more, and I change even further, and I become a disciple. I begin to realize that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I begin to realize that he is it. He's all I need. I don't need the chaos of the world or the wonder. And when I begin to let that Holy Spirit stir inside me, I am new. I'm different, and I'm changed. And people see that I'm different, right? And when you meet that person who was alive in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Lord, and they know he's it, and they've chosen, they've chosen to be his. You don't know what they've got, but you want to be a part of it. There's something that just leaks out of them. Now, if I let that sit long enough, what's going to happen? That chocolate's all going to go to the bottom, and eventually it's going to just look like plain milk again. So I have to keep stirring I have to keep inviting him. I have to keep offering him my day. And so what is this spoon that keeps it all stirred up? Well, as Catholics, we are blessed and grace-filled to know that the spoon is our prayer. The spoon is the scripture. The spoon is the Eucharist. The spoon is our community of believers that come together and stand with each other and help each other choose. You all got a big spoon today. You came because you wanted to find a way to be changed and to be stirred and to be alive. And the Holy Spirit is just waiting to do that for all of you because he's bigger than any pandemic. He's bigger than any disruption. He's bigger than any uncertainty. And we just have to ask him in, right? And then we stand back and we watch the amazing things he's done. And we listen to the way he's worked in other people's lives. And today you will be so lucky to hear from a few of your peers, people you know and love and go to mass with and go to school with, who have stirred that milk every day. They've stirred with prayer and the sacraments, and God has come in and he's changed them. And they're going to tell their story. And the first one today to come and share the way the Lord has worked in their life is the beautiful Brooke Hagspa. And so, Brooke, I'm not sure. Oh, here she comes. So give Brooke a hand. Um, yep, come right back here. Yep, go around. There we go. Give her a hand. She's got a long walk, right? So as Brooke comes over here, I just want you to all take a minute to call on the Holy Spirit to fill her and to be with her. And ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart and listen to her story and ask, Lord, how are you wanting to do that in my life? What do you need from me right now? So give it up for Brooke.
the doctors. So we started with like family doctors and stuff and they you know did all of the vitals, they did like blood tests, CAT scans, I, x-rays, I can't even remember all the tests that I did, um, and they couldn't find anything. So I re do respect doctors, I do, but um, my doctor, since he couldn't find anything physically wrong, he was like, you have an anxiety disorder. There's nothing wrong with that, I, I promise. It's just like, if you're in my position, it was very, very hard to hear that because I just knew that that wasn't what was going on and I was just really frustrated. So this all happened throughout my senior year. 2018 and 2019 was my senior year. Um, so I kind of relate to a lot of you guys that were seniors and missed out on a lot of stuff because I did as well. I barely got through prom and graduation. Hope, <laughs> thankfully I graduated, but it was a very, very hard year for me. So as I said, I graduated and um, naturally after you graduate, you go and get a job. So I was just trying to be optimistic. So I applied for a lot of different jobs, like state jobs, and I ended up getting one. So I was able to line one up for June. So I started at the beginning of June. However, halfway through, um, I was still having this chronic stomach pain and it had radiated into the back of my neck and my chin, a lot of tightness. And <laughs> I always, I kind of laugh at it, not really laugh, but um, like I was in a new place, um, like stuck on the seventh floor in a cubicle surrounded by so many people I did know. I'd only known them for like two weeks. And that just kind of like <laughs> made it even more stressful. So I ended up having to quit that job, which was very, very frustrating, very sad. But after that, we were like, okay, it's time to try to figure this out. So, um, well, we had been figuring it out as we were going, but now we were just like, okay, this is affecting her life. This is not good. So we went to see more doctors, including, um, including U of M. I just say that one just because it's probably one that you guys know. All the other ones, you guys would probably not know them. But um, then, like a lot of other places, they released me from their care and they're like, we don't know what's going on. Um, bye, pretty much. So I left there, went back to my doctor, and he still wasn't convinced that I didn't have anxiety. So he's like, you're going to see a psychologist. And I was like, fine. <laughs> so I go and I see the psychologist. And if you've never been to like a therapy or a psychologist before, they pretty much just ask you your story. They're like, what's going on? Just to kind of get a feel for what they're dealing with. Um, so, I'm, so I tell her all my symptoms and stuff and she's so confident. She's like, yes, you have this. I've seen this before. In a couple of weeks, you are gonna start feeling better. And in like four to six weeks, I think, she's like, this is gonna be completely gone. You're gonna learn to manage it. And I was like, and at this point, I'm like, I kind of told her this is what it is. This two weeks sounds pretty darn good. But it was about eight weeks, actually no, I think it was like three months later, she was, we walked in and she was like, she was acting weird and I was like, what's going on? And, and then towards the end of that ses session, she was like, I don't think that this is what you have. You're not getting any better. And <laughs> in a way I was like, finally somebody believes me. And in another way, it was just like another punch to the face. Like, this isn't what it is. <laughs> this is so frustrating. So we go back to the doctor. Um, we saw him for quite a few months until he finally was like, we are sending you to Mayo Clinic. And like, Mayo Clinic, if you don't know what it is, it's very well known for pretty much anybody with any sort of medical problem, getting you in and out very fast and sending you home with some sort of diagnosis, a plan of action that sort of stuff and in a way it was like it was like so scary because you know you never really wish that upon anybody to have to go to a place like Mayo Clinic because that's when you know it's like serious so it was scary but it was also like maybe I'll get an answer you know so we go to we oh sorry I skipped a part um, <laughs> so we get in contact with Mayo Clinic they are out in Minnesota so since they're far away, and as I said, they're very, very popular, so it's really hard to get in. And so we got in, and they're and at this point it was about mid-January, and they're like, we're not going to be able to get you in until the end of March. And 
for me, this was when my symptoms had really reached like their peak. I was very, very, very uncomfortable. So like this like crushed me. I was so thankful we could get in, but it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it was a very long time. So they're like, okay, but you can call us like every Monday or like any day of the week and you can ask for openings if there are any and we usually don't get them, but you are free to call. So since they're far away, they sent us all of our paperwork in the mail and we have some questions about it. And um, my mom was like, okay, we'll just call them tomorrow. It was a Monday. She was like, I already called them today to see if there are any openings and there weren't. So she was like, okay, I'll call them tomorrow on Tuesday and just get our question answered. So she calls them and she gets her answer and she just was like, you know, I called yesterday and there weren't any openings, but do you happen to have any openings now and I don't think she was really expecting to hear anything but she was like uh yeah next Monday February 4th and I was like what <laughs> so I I remember that call vividly my mom called me she's like pack your bags we're going to Mayo and I was like what <laughs> like kind of the whole like stressful exciting scary sort of feeling so I went to Mayo Mayo was a very mixed experience overall it was really good um, because they came up with a diagnosis and they were like, okay, we're going to send you back home and obviously you need to fix your problem at home because you can't just drive eight hours to Minnesota every day. So, so we found a physical therapist. What they had diagnosed me with was supposed to be fixed through PT. And I went to physical therapy for quite a few weeks and then around the end of March, um, the coronavirus hit. And if you're not <laughs> sort of connecting those dots, that was when COVID hit and that was when I was supposed to go to Mayo Clinic, which was absolutely insane. I think, <laughs> I honestly don't know how I would have responded and I don't really want to know how I would have responded if they called me the day before and they're like, uh, sorry, we're shutting down everything and you cannot come, especially after waiting for so long. So that was definitely a God thing and I am so thankful for it. And that just kind of brings me into the passage that this whole sort of um, conference is written around in John 12. And I'm gonna read John 12, 26 through 27. Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So pretty much after this, um, they're kind of asking for more of a physical sign. They're like, you sent our ancestors, manna, like we want to see an obvious sign. And he responded with, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And I think this really ties in with my story in just any sort of cross or struggle just because they they didn't really expect Jesus to respond that way. Um, I think as humans, we really like a direct answer. We're like, don't, don't have me read between the lines. Just <laughs> give it to me. And like, it's very frustrating, but I didn't expect, I didn't expect to go to Mayo and I was hoping that it was going to be like my saving grace, but it wasn't. But I don't know what God is thinking and that's, that's okay. We just have to believe it before we see it. It's not always about seeing and then believing. So that kind of gets me to the point of um, everything happens for a reason. As it said in the Bible, it said, God has set his seal. He's never going to let go. He has written your story. And one thing that I wanted to point out when I was actually writing this was I, ha I kind of had a weird, not a weird thought, it just kind of an interesting thought. It was like, in a way, our suffering is not random in the sense that God doesn't take, all, God doesn't like take us and separate us into good people and bad people. And he doesn't say only good things happen to good people and only bad things happen to the bad people. So in a way, that's random, but in a completely different way, it's not random. What happens in our lives is supposed to happen, and God wants that to happen. God literally wrote your story. He knows what is coming next. It's like when you start a new book and you don't know what's going to happen, you're like, how is this going to work out? And it does. The author always figures out a way to bring it together. 
And our crosses, they're, since they're personalized to us, they're all different, and they're given to us to better ourselves. And since we have free will, we can respond to our crosses in any way we want. Um, so how we take that cross and how we deal with it is what's important. But another thing that I wanted to point out is if you go the wrong way, it's never too late to come back. You can fall with your cross a million times, but what really matters is when you pick up that cross and you stand back up. Because that's what God wants you to do. And since God has set a seal, no matter what you do, you're never going to get rid of him. Sorry, you're not. He is always there no matter what you do. And I also thought this, this was very similar to the coronavirus or COVID or what's just been going on. We all have the same crosses. It's the same thing that's happening to all of us, but it affects us all differently. Some maybe emotionally, physically, spiritually. It just affects all of us differently, and it's what we did and also what we still do at that time that really, really matters. In times of uncertainty, we look to him because he is our author. He is our creator. In, um, in times of uncertainty, we just need to before we even see the end, before we even see success or renewal, we need to know that that renewal is going to come. And that just goes for any, any sort of cross, any sort of struggle that you have. And when I'm down, like, God just always brings me back. I just, it took a very long time. As I said, I'm still not good at it. I, <laughs> I am terrible at it sometimes, and that's just what happens. It's not supposed to be easy, otherwise everybody would do it. And Whenever I look, look to him, I just am reminded that everybody has different sufferings. Yes, it's physically different, emotionally different, all that sort of stuff. And But it was given to you for a reason. Like, that, that cross is entrusted to you, which is a huge responsibility. At least that's what I thought. And that's going to lead to things that you can't even imagine. And because of this, we are able to profess the goodness of God because he wrote our story. Who better to entrust your life to than the one who made your life, than the one who made your purpose? And it's, it's just crazy. And it's not easy. And I've been through so many scary times where I just look back and I'm like, how did I do that? Like, you know, you, like everybody has different crosses, but everybody gets gets to that point where they're just stuck, and you you just don't know what's gonna happen. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah. So God gets you through everything, and it's not just me. It's not just me. Every He'll get you through anything. And another thing I wanted to sort of close with is don't compare yourself to others. As I said. It may seem like your cross is a lot heavier than a lot of other people's, trust me. Um, but don't compare that. Don't compare yourself to others because everybody's story is different and everybody has a different purpose. And once you are open to what God has in store for you and you trust your life to him and just give it away and you're open, oh, I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> Stop crying. Um, <laughs> once you hand your life over to God, your life will never be the same. It just, it never will. And yeah, so that's my story. <laughs> I don't know how else to end it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. God is, is willing and waiting to do amazing things in all of our lives. Just have to invite him. And we have to accept that it's not always going to look like we planned, right? That he's bigger, he's in charge. But like Simon Peter, the Simon Peter in this says, But Lord, where else would I go? Where else would I go? He's it. Now, in a minute, we're going to have a chance to um, have adoration. And just a short bit of adoration. So we have a chance to just reflect and open our hearts and really bring Christ in 
to this day from the very beginning so um, as we take just a second to get a few things ready if you would like to stand up out of those back lawn chairs <laughs> before your legs go completely numb and just stand up and stretch a minute I'm gonna move a few things out of the way and then we're gonna you know start some prayer and reflection so just take a quick minute and stand up and stretch stay standing up, you can sit, you can do what's comfortable. But as we enter into this, this adoration, this intimate time with Jesus, where we can just open our hearts so that he can make the most of this day, right? This is our chance to choose, like the old man. This is our chance to, to choose joy, to choose peace, to choose trust, to choose obedience. It's, it's our chance to say, like Simon Peter, Lord, where else would I go? It's our chance to say, I don't want to go anywhere else. He's everything. He's it. Right? This is our chance to invite him in and surrender kind of all the craziness that's happened the last few months and start new. And so if you close your eyes, I'm going to give you some things that I'd really like you to think about. Right? So I want you to begin thinking about all of those disappointments all of that brokenness, all of those events that were a normal part of teenage life that just kind of passed us by, right? Those goodbyes we didn't get to say, or the graduation, the prom, the, you know, the, the baseball season, the track season, the, the basketball state titles that so possibly could have been ours. Just all of those things just go through that list and ask the Lord to come in and bring you the grace to get past those disappointments and that brokenness. Ask him to give you hope for a future to know that he's in this day. But Lord, give us a chance to heal from our sadness and our grief. Lord, we ask you to come in, come into our future. You know, those days ahead when we're unsure and uncertain and folks can't quite seem to agree on the best way to move forward. And Lord, we give you those worries. We give you that anxiety. We give you that wonder and that fear. Lord, we just ask you to come into all of that and Lord, just just be with us. And so, list it all out for him. Give him all of it. All your worries, all your fears, all your wonders. Give him the list. And Jesus, come. Jesus, just come in the middle of all of that and please bring us your peace. Please bring us your joy. Lord, remind us you're where we need to go. And Lord, the third place we'd like you to really come into our hearts today is when we pray for the people who, who are making decisions that affect us in our school, in our parish, in our community. Lord, we Please just ask you to bless all the principals and superintendents and leaders and people who are making big decisions. Lord, give us the strength to obey and to follow the leadership of our bishop, our pastors, our school and government leaders. And Lord, please just, we ask you for peace in our world. Bring your peace, your justice. And so, the final thing I want you to prepare your heart for is just a list of all those things that are kind of making you crazy. And Lord, just come with your wisdom. Come with your grace. 
and just lift to the Lord right now all of those worries that are in your heart. And I ask you now to kneel or to stand or to sit or whatever posture is most prayerful for you as we wait for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Thank you. 
there's hope for the hopeless. Gone all too straight. Come and sit at the table. Come and taste the grace. There's rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow. Heaven. something that Brooke shared in her testimony resonated with you. Or maybe one of the things that Sherry, or multiple things that Sherry mentioned that's been upended in your life has been just a huge burden and you're not sure how to deal with it or how to surrender that to the Lord. As we begin this day, this is the opportunity to just share your burden to the Lord. It says, come to you to me, all you who are labored and heavy burdened, he will take your yoke upon him. Lord, that your dying and suffering is not in vain. We just pour our hearts out to you. You're before us on the altar. Whatever those burdens are that we're carrying, surrender them to you today. Trade shoulders.
Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Just an awesome, awesome way uh, to really start this off and, and for us to give give those things over. Like Sherry talked about, like Brian talked about towards the end, and handing those burdens over to the Lord. And as you saw Father leave with Jesus and go to the church, if you hadn't felt like you really... Uh, maybe maybe something just kind of started to work within you as we got towards the end. Or, or maybe there's still things stirring in your heart. That's what adoration and confession are going to be for you guys. Okay, those are going to be available opportunities for you guys to go and continue to lay those things down at the Lord's feet. Um, and, and just as we sat and as we prayed and as we adored, I, I just I can't help but encourage you. I mean, it's just God is speaking so clearly to me about you guys. And he's like, I, I want them so bad. I want them so bad. You know, and it's, it's not very often that I, I feel like God's just like imprinting something on my head that hard. But he wants you to know that he, he wants you more than you can ever imagine. And so if you didn't feel like you were able to open up, I really encourage you to take that, that time later today when we have those opportunities for you. But know whether you're someone who's never been to a conference like this before, and you've never opened yourself up to the Lord before, or you're someone who, who's been to a lot of conferences, uh, but you mostly go because it's a good time and your friends go, or you're someone who's super involved and you feel like you have a really great relationship with Christ. It does not matter who you are in those either of those scenarios. He wants you just the same and just as badly. So throughout the rest of the day, don't hold back. I mean, it, honestly, it almost brings me to tears that I think about how hard those words were ringing in my head and how bad he wants you guys. All right, so we're going to keep moving forward. And, that, and that's your guys' goal for the day. Just be open to receive. You don't have to do anything. You just got to receive and let, let the Lord work the way he wants to work. Okay, so again, we just praise Jesus for that. And so we're moving forward again to our next talk. And pretty soon... Um, we're going to have some time for you guys to move around, but I, I wanted to get this speaker up for you guys. He came from the state of Ohio, uh, also known as Ohio, for those, for those who don't know. Yeah. Ohio. <laughs> I, it, yeah, oh, yeah. I, we don't really support Ohio, but we support Dan. His name's Dan Demite, and you guys, he, he's an awesome, awesome man led by the Holy Spirit. We've seen him speak at some places before, and if you haven't, I'm really excited for you guys. Um, I, it just always led by the Spirit, even from Ohio. He's actually the head of a Catholic youth summer camp um, where there's amazing missionaries who are leading the youth to come into great relationships with the Lord. So without any further ado, let's give him a round of applause and bring him up on stage. All right. Hey, thanks so much, Jordan. Yeah, you know that I'm from Ohio. We like to say O-H-I-O. -O. The good news about being in Ohio, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm from Ohio, but I'm not an Ohio State fan, so you can like me, right? Um, but I'm actually a Notre Dame fan, and the nice thing about being a Notre Dame fan from Ohio is that you get to watch Michigan lose twice every year, right? <laughs> oh, man, no one even laughed. All right, hey, friends, here's the deal. So we, I run a high adventure sports camp uh, for the Catholic Church. It's called Catholic Youth Summer Camp. We have high adventure activities that lead to a high adventure faith. You guys have been sitting around for a while. I'm going to have everyone stand up. And you're gonna do 15 jumping jacks, okay? Are you guys ready? Ready? One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. Give yourselves a round of applause. Oh, yeah, okay, now since you've been quiet, I need you to yell Jesus as loud as you can on the count of three. One, two, three, Jesus! 
All right, that was decent, right? But we can do a little bit better than that just so that we make some neighbors in the neighborhood pee their pants a little bit. Like, what's all that noise? All right, so let's try it. One, two, three. Well done, well done, awesome. So grab a seat. So ever since I was young, I was kind of a fan of doing crazy things. So by the time I was in seventh grade, I was uh, juggling all sorts of different things. And I had picked up the habit of juggling machetes by the time I was in seventh grade. It's pretty fun. Um, so these are real machetes. Uh, anyone who thinks that they're fake, why don't you come raise your, uh, raise your hand if you think they're fake. Good, okay, good. I was gonna, who wants to volunteer to lay down while I juggle them? Anyone? No? Okay, great. All right, so here's the deal. We're gonna juggle these this morning. You guys ready? Okay, when I start juggling, uh, uh, I haven't yet, but at some point I'm gonna drop in front of a crowd. I feel like with the sun in my eyes, that would probably be the perfect time to do that. So if I drop them, I just need you to point and laugh at me. Can you do that? Just, just practice. One, two, three. Okay, there were some of you that giggled a bit, but no one actually pointed. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Very good, very good. So if I drop them, just point and laugh, okay? If I cut my face open, just cry, okay? All right, yeah, that's done. It's nice. Okay, let's try it. Okay, hurry up and clap. Hurry up and clap, people. Hurry, hurry, hurry. All right. All right, so here's the deal. When I juggle machetes, everyone always says, uh, Dan, can you light them on fire, right? And if you could see these better, I have attempted to light them on fire. It's rather hard to do so, but I did bring my torches with us today, okay? So I'm gonna need a volunteer to help me juggle my torches. So first person, who wants to volunteer? Okay, come on up, yeah. Let's give her a round of applause. All right, what's your name? Julia. Julia? All right, Julia, okay, here you, here, you're gonna hold those really close to your face while I juggle them, okay? No, I'm just kidding. I mean, well, I like them. All right, Julia. Oh man, I don't even know. All right, can you light each torch? Oh yeah. Okay, Julia, for the crowd, can you confirm that these are real fire? Okay, they're real, okay, great. So we're gonna juggle these flaming torches. I'm out here and not under there because if I was under there, I'd set your little Barn on fire. Can you hold these again? Okay, what well, would be impressive if I juggle these torches, but what's going to be even more impressive is I'm going to juggle these flaming hot torches while wearing a really cool bandana. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, Julia. All right, this time, if I drop them, don't point and laugh. Just turn and run. This grass is looking pretty dry. We don't want death all over the place. All right, you ready? Okay, got it. Oh yeah, all right, hurry up, hurry up and clap, hurry, 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 hurry. All right, funny story, so the first time I juggled torches, I didn't read the directions well enough, and it said I was, in eight, I was going into my eighth grade year uh, as, a, as a 12 year old, and it just said dip the torches in lighter fluid, and I didn't realize that you also had to wring the lighter fluid out, that was not in the directions. So I'm juggling and lighter fluid is flying all over my body, and I realize I'm covered in lighter fluid, and I freak out and the torch hits my arm and all of my arm here goes boosh up in the flames. And so I went to school the first day uh, of eighth grade with one hairy arm and one naked arm. It was awkward. Okay, all right, Julia, you're gonna help me out again, okay? Is it Julia or Juliana? No, sorry, okay, Juliana. All right, ready? You're gonna blow it out, it goes like this. One, two, one, two. No, like this, one, two. No, no, like this. No, no. Who wants to try and blow this out? Let's give Julian a round of applause. All right, who wants to try and blow it out? All right, come on up. What's your name, dude? I'm Troy. Troy, all right, here you go. All right, Troy, you got big lungs? Can uh, you handle this? I talk a lot, so maybe. Just like that. No, no, like this. Hey! Good job, give Troy a round of applause. All right, friends. 
So Jordan asked me just to speak a little bit about how I came to fall in love with Jesus uh, in this first session. And I just want to speak about the fact that Jesus wants to set our hearts ablaze, right? Like there's, there's, the, 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 there's a clear difference between a person who knows Jesus and, and a person whose heart is on fire with the love of God, right? That when Jesus captivates your heart, he actually wins something inside of you and he sets your heart on fire. He said in the Gospel of Luke, he's walking towards Jerusalem, and he says, I have come to set the earth on fire, right? So say fire. Okay, that was really kind of lame. I'm not going to lie. Okay, say fire. Oh, yeah, there you go. So he said, I've come to set the earth on fire, but how I wish it were already ablaze. So the Lord wants to set our hearts on fire. But I think a lot of times we encounter a God who maybe isn't worth following or who doesn't captivate our hearts completely, right? And so because of that, we give him very little or we drop a little bit for him. Let me let me start with just saying us telling one of the scripture accounts, right? It comes from Matthew chapter four. It says, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, mending their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Right? You know what Lord appears all the time in the Gospels? Immediately. You, you know what Lord never appears in the Gospels? Gradually. Right? So when you encounter Jesus in the Gospels, it says that the person was immediately healed, or they immediately dropped their nets and followed him. That there was something about Jesus that led to this insane immediate reaction to drop everything and follow him. I was preparing a, a young boy named Clay for confirmation, and Clay is, is a little different than a lot of uh, than, uh, than a lot of us, different than you and I. Clay had autism. And Clay is awesome because uh, he's able to think and process and see the world in just such a unique, beautiful way. And as I was preparing him for confirmation, I read this account to him. I said, Clay, what do you think it was about Jesus that led to such a bold response? And I started to kind of explain the scene to him. I was like, you know, Clay, Andrew and Peter, James and John, they were fishermen. And that was their job. And, and what they caught that day, that was literally the food they fed their families. It wasn't like they had a savings account. They didn't have a retirement plan. They, they lived, they worked so they could live. And they're at work and Jesus comes to them and they just leave their job and follow him. I said, Clay, what was it about Jesus that led to such an intense remark? And Clay gets really quiet. And he closes his eyes, and he clenches his fist, and he buries his head down. And he's like thinking and thinking and thinking for what felt like a long, long five minutes of silence. And then all of a sudden, Clay opens his eyes, and he gets just really excited. And he's like, Dan, there must have been something amazing about Jesus. There must have been something amazing about Jesus. I love that reaction because it was so simple and so profound at the same time that there was this God named, this man named Jesus who was walking and they saw in him something that was so captivating, so amazing that they said, I'm going to just leave everything and follow you. That everything else in the world, all the other things, all their other dreams, their, their other goals, their problems, their, their hopes, everything else paled in comparison to this person they encountered that day. And I think it's so interesting because so often we have an encounter with Jesus just like we did in adoration. And we encounter Jesus himself and yet we drop very little. Right? I mean we may drop a few of our bad habits, we may drop a few of our sins, we may drop a few dollars in the collection basket, we may, we may drop a few things, but do we drop everything and say, Jesus, I want to give you all of my life for the rest of my life. And I wonder why that is, right? 
I wonder if maybe we haven't encountered a God who's worth following. A God who captivates our hearts, who steals our hearts, and leads us into this encounter with him that makes us want to give him everything. I know growing up for me, it was a little weird in the way they sometimes presented Jesus, right? That growing up, Jesus was kind of a God that was presented in such a way that wasn't always worth following. And what do I mean by that? I, I have some pictures today. I hope you're able to see them. We're going to try to put them on the screen of just some pictures and images of Jesus that I encountered growing up that made it a little hard for me to say, I want to drop everything. Um, okay, I'm going to click. Did it, did it pop up? Can you guys see it? Let me see. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Can you see it? Raise your hand if you can actually see the image. Okay, great. So this is, this is an image of a claymation cartoon Jesus that it's like an anime, and he's hopping down a yellow brick road, and uh, there's trees. And I don't know if you can see, but the, the, the apples on the trees are little hearts. And it's like Jesus is like hopping down the yellow brick road, grabbing heart-shaped fruit off of trees and then giving them to everyone, right? Sometimes when we're little kids, it's like uh, we're presented with a Jesus as if he's all about cotton candy and lollipops and sunshine and flowers, right? You get like stickers and lollipops and coloring pages that say, Jesus loves you. And, and while there's great truth in that, that Jesus, of course, loves you, sometimes the faith is presented in a way that's not very compelling for someone that is growing up in the faith, right? And I, so I remember going to Catholic schools and saying, oh, weird, right? I'm not sure if I want to like give my life to a Jesus that's all about cotton candy and sunshine. Here's another picture. This is, uh, oh man, it's a little tough to see. This is Jesus playing baseball, right, with the kid. So if you can't see the image, Jesus is there, and, and the kid is swinging the bat, and, and, and Jesus has his arms wrapped around the kid swinging the bat with him, right? My mom gave me this picture when I was a kid because I loved baseball, and it was a little funky because uh, it's like, okay, mom, I get it. Like, Jesus is with me in everything that I do, but you're just kind of like, well, wait, but why, like, why is Jesus, like, hugging me while I'm trying to play baseball? I was a terrible batter growing up. I was really good first baseman, but I wasn't great at batting. I was always like, okay, like, maybe that's why I can't hit. Jesus is, like, all over me, right? Like, that's a little awkward. Another image of Jesus here, we got Jesus playing basketball with two little eight-year-old kids. And if you can see this image, Jesus is playing basketball. These kids are throwing the ball up in the basket. It appears in this statue that I had as a child that Jesus is actually towering over these two little eight-year-olds. And as he's playing basketball, the one kid is throwing it up in the air, and Jesus is up in the air packing the ball down in his face. I'm like, why is Jesus doing that, right? And so these images growing up of Jesus, it wasn't something that, like, I met someone so amazing. I was like, oh, my gosh, I want to give my life to you, right? This is one of my favorite images of Jesus. Can you guys see this? Raise your hand if you can see this one. This is a good one. I call this Malibu Jesus, okay? It's Jesus on the, like, he's holding a net, and his hair is beautifully shaped, and he's got this beautiful, white, luscious smile. And you're just like, wow, that's a little interesting and awkward. My mom had this picture that she would pray with uh, every night, and she'd put it in front, uh, uh, like, uh, on the table while she prayed her Bible. And that was such a beautiful witness to me, because my mom read her scriptures at the table every single night, so I saw that it was a witness. But I also saw this picture, and I was like, wow, that's a little weird. Like, it looks like Jesus is trying to sell Pantene Pro V hair products or something like, hey, come follow me, and I will give you beautiful, shiny hair, right? A little, little unique. And then I got into high school, right? And in high school, Jesus changed, right? And you can see this picture, Jesus is the cool dude, right? He's wearing Chuck Taylors, he's got a leather jacket on, and everyone in high school wanted to, like, present Jesus like he was, like, really cool. And if you followed Jesus, you were awesome, right? I remember I'd go to these conferences, and people would be like, guys, 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 the kids are at the parties on, on, on Friday nights, they're not the cool ones. You guys are the cool ones here at this conference because you're good for Jesus. I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, the, they're still pretty cool. And this kid next to me is like, yeah. And he's got snot dripping down his nose. And he's like, what? And, uh, and so, like, I don't follow Jesus because I become cool if I follow Jesus. I don't follow Jesus because he's the cool dude, right? I follow Jesus because he's the Lord and Savior of the world. And then in high school, too, this image of Jesus, who's our buddy, right? If you see that picture, it's, it's Jesus posing and, like, sticking his fingers out, like, hey, you're my buddy. This idea that, like, Jesus is just our, our best friend, right? 
And I started conferencing the people that, guys, 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 listen up. Just treat Jesus like he's your best friend, right? Just talk to him like he's your best friend. And, like, that's what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And that's awesome and true, right? Like, there's an element of that which is, which is excellent, that Jesus himself calls us, calls himself our friend, right? He says, no greater love is there than this, to lay your life down for your friend. But the problem with seeing Jesus as just your friend is he's also the king of heaven and earth. He's also the creator of truth itself. And so with my buddies in high school, I would see like my buddies and they'd be like, oh, yeah, this is what I think. I'd be like, no, that's stupid. I think something different. And I actually started to treat Jesus that way where like I would hear the church teach one thing. And I'd be like, well, I agree with that. So I'll believe that. Right. And then I'd hear the church teach another thing. I'd be like, oh, no, that's stupid. I disagree with that. And I started to pick and choose what morality I wanted to live. But ultimately, all of these images of Jesus never compelled my heart to want to give my life to him. They never set my heart on fire, right? And so I lived in high school with one foot in and one foot out, living kind of a, a double life where I, I would go to youth group on Sunday nights. I would go to, to mass on Sunday mornings. My mom was, was all about making sure we always went to mass. So even though I didn't want to go, I was there, right? And I wanted to go to youth group on Sunday nights because I was trying to get into Notre Dame. I wanted a full ride scholarship. I thought it would look really good on my transcripts. So I made sure I was at, at youth group, right? So I could be seen as a good leader. And, and yet I was always one foot in and one foot out. I was living a life of immorality. I was falling into to all kinds of different mortal sins with different friends or with girls. And, and, and my, my life was just kind of inside and out. I remember one day, my senior year of high school, the very beginning of senior year, I, I started to um, just kind of long for more. And I had been dreaming to get in a full ride or to get into Notre Dame. And I had been dreaming to, to go to state for wrestling. And a lot of my dreams were starting to fade away. They weren't looking as appealing as, as I had once thought they were. And I encountered this final image of Jesus, which you probably can't see, but it's just the crucified Lord, right? And I was in my bedroom one night, very simple night, where my heart was kind of longing for more. And I, my mom, while she had all these interesting images of Jesus throughout our house, she also had this crucifix in every one of our bedrooms. And my senior year of high school, I, I, I came to realize just who Jesus was. It was as if in that moment, by myself, in my room, the Paschal mystery became alive to me. I don't know if you know what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago, but there's this man who actually walked this earth, who called himself God. And this God man was born in a cave. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born as royalty. He was born in a cave filled with manure and mud and dirt. He was laid in the feeding trough of animals and was born dirt poor. Why? Because he wanted to show us that there is no heart, there is no life, there is no person that's too far off, too distant, too dirty, too messy for me to enter in. Right? I think sometimes we think, man, I'm just too far gone. And Jesus says, you're the one I want. I chose not to come for the clean, but into the hearts of the dirty so I can purify you and heal you. And this man named Jesus, as he walked the earth, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. He cured the crippled. Everywhere he went, miracles happened, and he proclaimed that he was God. And for that reason, people wanted to kill him. And he finds himself one night in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's there, and he's crying out. He said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But not as I will, but as you will. And it says in the scriptures that Jesus started to sweat blood. I don't know if you know this, but that's an actual medical condition called hemotridrosis. It's when the blood vessels burst and you start excreting blood out of your sweat glands. Doctors say that if you have hemotridrosis, it's usually because you're in this point of insane, uh, uh, this, this, this place of insane stress. And what it does to your body is it wipes you out completely, physically. You can barely move, much less walk. 
And Jesus is there in the garden. He knows the weight of all the sin of the world and all the pain and all the hurt and all the burden of the world is about to be placed on him. And he's there and he's sweating blood. He has hemotrichosis. He can barely move and he's crying out to the Father. And then he's pulled out of the garden and he's drugged through the streets in chains. And he goes from one trial to another trial to another trial where people create lies and false accusations about him. They spit on him. They mock him. They throw him to the ground. And Pontius Pilate orders him to be scourged at the pillar. And the scourge in the pillar was one of the greatest ways to torture people back in the Roman days. The Romans 2,000 years ago were the best at human torture, knowing the man. And the scourge of the pillar had a cat of nine tails, which was a whip with nine different lashes on it. And iron balls and glass shards going down every single lash. The, the idea behind this was that the iron balls would bruise the skin and the glass would rip the skin right off the body. Jesus was condemned to probably be lashed about 29 times. Historically, they say 39, I mean 30 lashes is the point of death. So whip after whip after whip, the skin being ripped off of his body and his blood pouring out on the ground, mocked and betrayed. And then they take this crown of thorns, which historically the thorns still grow in the Holy Land today. They're about three inches in length, and they take the, sword, the thorns, they place it on his head, and they say they take reeds, and they pierce the thorns into his head. Could you imagine thorns going into your eyelids, your ears, your skull? And then they mock him, and they, they make fun of him for being the king of kings, and they falsely worship him. And then they're not satisfied enough, so Pontius Pilate condemns Jesus to death. And as Jesus is condemned to death, this man whose body is completely wiped of all energy, whose skin has been ripped off of his body, takes a tree on his shoulders and walks up Calvary. And as he walks, he falls. And just imagine rocks and stones and dirt coming into all these open wounds on his body. And he finds himself on the top of Calvary, also known as the place of the skull. You know, historically, Calvary was a trash dump. The reason the Romans would crucify you on Calvary was it was outside the Roman city, and it was a trash dump right out the city walls. They wanted to humiliate you, so as you were crucified, everyone would know if you defy Roman law, this is your fate. And they, tra they, they used the trash dump because it was convenient. As you died, they would take your dead corpse and just throw it in the trash dump. And Jesus was there hanging, suffering. Treated like trash, like his life didn't matter. And he, nailed, he was nailed there and he cries out in a loud voice, I thirst. And they say as Jesus died, what would happen during crucifixion is that your shoulders would become dislocated and your pectoral muscles would become dislocated and you would fall forward and your lungs would come and crush, I mean your, your ribs would come and crush your lungs. So the only way to survive was to pull yourself up so that your ribcage fell back into place and your lungs had the chance to breathe again. That's why in the scriptures they go to break the legs of the man on the left and the right of Jesus so that they would die, they would suffocate. And when they went to Jesus to break his legs, they noticed he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. So Jesus is there suffocating to death and he cries out in a loud voice, I thirst! And just in that moment in my bedroom, early in my senior year, looking at Jesus, my heart was just set on fire. Because for the first time in my life, I understood his love for me. I heard him say, Dan, I thirst for you. In the depths of my heart, not in an audible voice, but I heard these words from Jesus. And he said, Dan, my love for you cost me my life. What has your love for me ever cost you? Just look at that question and imagine Jesus asking that question. My love for you cost me my life. What has your love for me ever cost you? And that question cut me to the heart because I realized how complacent, how lukewarm, how mediocre my Christian life had been up to that point. 
I realized that I was following Jesus, but I had dropped nothing, or maybe I had dropped just a very little bit. Brothers and sisters, in that moment, in this moment of intense love, the only natural response to a question like that is, Jesus, I want my love for you to cost me my life as well. I want to give you everything. You see, Jesus, he gave us every drop of his blood and every beat of his heart and every breath of his lungs was poured out on the cross. And there I was like, Jesus, I want to pour myself out for you. I wonder, are we following Jesus in such a way that we're pouring ourselves out like he poured himself out? Or have we settled into a comfort Christianity? The models ourselves more like the lukewarm Christians in this world as opposed to modeling ourselves like the Christ himself we claim to follow. Brothers and sisters, Jesus did not tell us to follow the imitation of other Christians. He said, follow me. Imitate me. Live my lifestyle. And I can't tell you that I know exactly what that means, but I know that Jesus lived a life that was completely poured out for the sake of others. He lived a life that was completely poured out for love. And I just want to close with reading that scripture again. That as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw you. I want you to just close your eyes. I want you just to picture Jesus. What does he actually look like? Was he one of the images that you saw? <laughs> but I want you to close your eyes and use your imagination. And I want you to picture Jesus walking here before you today. As Jesus was walking, he saw you. He saw the way you were living your life and what you were doing. And he said to you, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Peter and Andrew's response was immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. I just want you, as you see Jesus and you hear him say your name, and you hear him invite you to follow him, I want you to look down at your hands and see maybe what you're holding. What have you been holding on to? What have you been afraid to drop? Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's fear. But Jesus, he says, if you follow me, you need to drop whatever you're clinging to so that I can give you the full and abundant life. Just here in a moment of silence, just ask the Lord, Lord, reveal to me what I'm clinging to that's not of you. And then say, Jesus, I give it over to you. I drop it. I drop it. So I can follow you. Go ahead and open your eyes. I want to just tell you this because I think it's really important. The person you were yesterday does not have to define the person you will be tomorrow. The way you interacted at school when school let out in March or April or whenever it let out does not have to determine the way you act and live when school starts over again. The way you loved your family yesterday does not have to determine the way you love your family tomorrow. You see, Jesus Christ came to give us a new life, a different life. He didn't come to be an accessory to the life that we have. He came to change our life and to transform it, to redefine it and reshape it. Amen? Amen. So we're going to turn it back over to Jordan. Thank you, brother. You know, in this this conference, 
like I said, we, we, we come here today to profess our faith in the Lord. And, and in doing that, that does change us. Right? Sometimes the first step in, in like doing something, like if you're trying to sit down and like do your homework, we always say like the first and hardest part of writing a paper is like sitting down and like starting to write. It's always that first page. And sometimes for our faith, like our first step is just actually proclaiming, like, yes, Lord, like you're the one. You're the Holy One of God. It's us taking that leap of faith. And so if we're seeking that change, it's recognizing that we need to proclaim that. We need to take that step. We need to profess what we truly believe. Okay, so let, let's do that. Not just today, but every day going forward. All right, so now we're going to give you guys a break. You guys have been just sitting in the sun. So there's a few things I want to let you know. First, in that uh, Pepsi-Cola cooler over there, that is just like chucked full of waters for you guys. Go take them. Take a few of them. Make sure you guys are staying hydrated, okay? Please, please, please take a lot of water. In about 15 minutes, there's going to be two breakout sessions. One is going to be here with Dan, and it's going to be about how you can live your life in a missionary way, like here and now, and not going across the country, not going somewhere else, but here and now. How can you be a missionary here? And then over by the parish office is going to be Sherry, and she's going to talk about uh, giving tips on how you can stay engaged in your faith as you begin to end, like reach the end of high school and go into college. And like, what are things you can do on your own that are going to keep you engaged in your faith? Things you can do, not relying on like the, the ministry we do at our church necessarily. All right, so you're going to have both of those options. Those are going to be at uh, 3:20. They're going to start. So in the meantime, you can get water, go to the bathroom, get some food, get elephant ears. Um, french fries. I would just ask that if you're going to be at this, which is where Dan's at, if you're going to be here, please don't eat your french fries here because we want to keep this clean for mass, uh, which is going to follow later. So if you're going to the other one, feel free to bring them or if you just want to eat them after or around. We're going to turn on the sprinkler in the back if you want to just dunk your head in the water because it's scorching hot. Feel free to do that. Um, other than that, so at 320, we're going to start the breakouts. And remember when you go to the breakout, if you're going over there, please remain socially distanced for the talk. All right, thanks, guys.